Welcome everyone to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 13th of September 2020 and today we are going to talk a little bit about music. So let me jump into the agenda really quickly here and then we'll bring Lloyd in just to uh, introduce him and to kind of jump into our question and answer session. So if you got the email we sent out earlier, we are going to focus today on music. We brought in Lloyd Puckett who has an extensive background in recording and mixing music. And um, so that's going to be our main topic. If we have time at the end, we have a couple more things I can run over really quickly. Just a little experience recently with microphone cables. Also for those on Pro Tools, we'll come back to that uh, as we have time. So, all right, let's go ahead and bring our friend Lloyd in and there we go. All right. Hi, Curtis. Hi there. Lloyd, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Glad to be here. All right. Um, let's... let's um, Talk a little bit about your background, first of all. So if I'm not mistaken, you're a percussionist, is that right? Yes, that's that's what started everything was uh, a music, I th if I remember right, fifth or sixth grade is when I started. And yeah, that continued through drum corps until I was 20. Okay. And then how did you end up launching a career in recording from there or in, in, in I guess, but not just recording, but that's, I think that's kind of your first step along the career path. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't go to college. I mean, I, I went to college for a semester as um, a percussion performance major, mm -hmm. but you know, we, I just couldn't afford it. It was just too much money. Um, and so that kind of led me into, uh, uh, I had kind of an injury on my foot a little bit and I couldn't play the drum set, which is what I really wanted to do. And so to be in the studio, I started, um, learning recording and uh, being the, the skills to become a recording engineer. And so I had I, the band that I was in when I was young had a, a guitar player that was fairly well off or his parents were. And um, he had some equipment that uh, he hired a gentleman from Chicago. I lived near Chicago at, back in high school. And now um, he hired a gentleman to come in and kind of wire the studio. And that gentleman is my mentor to this day, a um, guy named Goho Tada. Um, and so that kind of started it. And um, I've worked in Chicago, New York. Uh, when I moved back to Chicago here in 2002-ish, I, I left the music business. I just didn't, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. But, you know, high school through, through then, that's kind of how the process started. I, I had a mentor. He helped me get in Chicago that progressed to New York. I had my career for that 10 or 12 year span. And then I kind of left the business. Okay. Tell us, uh, if you can, what are some of your, some, you know, it, it was a part of it. It sounds like it was the music industry just changed so dramatically around that time. Like there was a huge, huge change, but before that, um, what are some of kind of your favorite memories of of working in the studio on, on particular albums and such. Yeah, so I do enjoy the technical side of it. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I I grew up in an era after a true electrical engineer might have been a recording engineer. Um, you know, back in the day, you know, folks that were recording engineers may have built the equipment that they're, you know, the compressors that are running through, and I, I didn't have any sort of that training and and not many engineers um, do anymore. But uh, the, the thrill that I had was being in the performance aspect, you know, being around the musicians, creating the vibe, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. And that entire aspect of creating the album was just very, very interest interesting and intriguing to me. And, and having the technical skill to, to make a difference and make a recording sound good, that was, that was huge. Um, and that, 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 that was the attraction. Yeah. And so who are some of the artists that you work with? Um, I guess probably the most well-known are, you know, and this is based on nineties. <laughs> so it's, it's been a while, but <laughs> there's a band called fuel that I did. I did some work on, uh, an awesomely talented gentleman, Matthew sweet. Um, who I worked with on one album, quite a few others, but as a main engineer, I worked with him on one album. Mm -hmm. Um, done some stuff with Depeche Mode and Erasure and, uh, you know, I don't, I hate talking about that stuff, but that's if fair. you wanted to look it up, there's a, <laughs> there's a list of my, um, 
recordings, at least a large part of them on allmusic.com. Uh -huh. Okay. Very good. And then, so from there, you know, again, the music industry changed dramatically um, around that time when you left and wh where, where, what's kind of been your trajectory since then? You're still very much, while you, while you left that part of the industry, you're still very much focused on, you know, recording and sound design and things of that nature. So kind of what was your next step after that? Well, the, you know, it, it's, it's awesome being on this channel because and talking about this because the technology is really what changed, right? So we went from tape and analog based um, recording techniques mm -hmm. and I was in the transition to computer based, um, you know, looking at your, what your agenda where you've got a pro tools update. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I worked uh, with pro tools when it was called sound designer and it was a two channel interface. Wow. That, um, that's, and that's all it was with two channels kind of meant for editing and mastering and uh, one little quick ha ha nineties kind of tech story. Um, the gentleman who had, I worked at a studio called access recording and Francois Kevorkian was the owner and he was so proud. He came walking in with the hard drive for the new pro uh, sound designer system. And we were going to mass, they were, they were going to master their first album on it. And this, this, this drive was, I think, a foot by a foot by eight inches. It's this huge thing. It cost $2,500. Can you guess how, how much data could be stored on it? Uh, a gigabyte? Good guess. No, literally 650 megabytes, enough to put wow. a CD together. Like you had to master <laughs> it in a certain way. It was crazy. So had a scuzzy interface. But anyway, oh, yeah. I, I've 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 gone through that transition with technology from the beginning to um, accepting it, which a lot of people didn't in the '90s, uh, and trying to make it better. And so, I got very interested in networking and just the computer aspect of what we were doing because nobody knew how to make all that stuff work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when I got kind of fed up with the process of the music business, which a whole nother story. I, I decided that I was going to go into computer networking or um, certification school. So I did that. And my friend at the time had a tele um, telephony company and I came and worked with uh, him for a while in the early 2000s um, as a network engineer. So I've got a little musical and technical background. And so that, that was the first pursuit. And then um, that kind of fell through uh, because of gov governmental changes and, and things. And so I got back into teaching uh, uh, music and that has been my focus since about 2008, nine. Yep, yep. And as we talked about, so for those that didn't catch it last time, back in May, 2019, uh, Lloyd and I had a conversation on one Sounds of our right. Sound for Video sessions. and. And we talked a little bit about pageantry arts and your your work with the Santa Clara Vanguard. So mm -hmm. um, some cool stuff there too. Yeah, um, very fortunate to be involved with those great people. Yeah, it's a good good organization and great performers. So, okay, well, let's uh, we're going to jump into some questions here. So we had a good number of questions submitted ahead of time. So let's go ahead and switch over there and uh, talk through some things here. First one up is from Jeff, uh, two-part question. It seems like with dialogue gain staging, the minus 20 zone works well, but with acoustic instruments, there's a greater range of dynamics, which makes gaining up problematic with peaking when an instrument goes from quiet to lots of attack. The cumulative effect of getting each track sounding its best seems to add up to the master channel peaking if one is not too careful. And then we'll jump over to question number two, which is sort of related. Is there a top end range on the scale that one should be aiming when recording and tracking that differs from tracking dialogue? If dialogue is around minus 20, would music be around minus 12? Or is it, be, is it best practice to treat all sources the same in terms of gain and keep them at around minus 20? Hmm. Well, I'm gonna take the second part first. That's kind okay. of a quick answer. Um, yes, there is a different level um, ideology um, with music and it really has little to do with music. Um, it has more to do with A to D conversion. So anytime that you have 
that process, whether you go A to D or D to A, um, if you're not at full scale, you are losing bits. So in other words, you could be set up in your chain end to end as a 24-bit signal, but if you're a sig um, excuse me, 24-bit um, route, but if you're if you're actual recorded level is way down to that you're not at 24 technically that signal is not at 24 bit right so the, the entire chain is but your audio is degraded a little bit compared to what it could be if it would it was brought in and out at a higher level does that make sense mm -hmm. um it's something that it took you know i'm coming to um production sound new so that was something that really shocked me is, um, but I've, I, I, I get the picture now, so to speak, um, <laughs> where you're trying to create audio that matches the video. You're creating the, uh, you know, the audible environment. And so mm -hmm. it needs to all match. And a lot of people record, you know, these calibrated systems, which was something that was completely new to me and, and recording everything as it is. And then it gets played back in the movie the same way it was recorded. So it's a very different process for music. Um, so that's that's this part two. Okay. Part one. <laughs> um, so it's kind of built on the same setup. So you need to, at the, the end goal has to be the A to D conversion, right? When you're recording. So you need to not worry about where, um, the overall level in terms of I'd, I need to hit minus 20 or minus 12, that isn't the goal. The goal is to be able to get as much input into that A to D conversion as you can without going over. And it is very difficult on acoustic instruments. Like um, I took the liberty of watching the video that, uh, who is what? It's what Jeff. The name? Jeff. Jeff. So yeah. Jeff sent a, a link with a video and it sound, sounded really good, but I could kind of hear the questions that you're having in the, in the recording. Um, and so th those natural peaks that are really common can be dealt with by, by distancing, of, you know, mic technique, different mics, um, whether you use tube or, or not. Um, but also a little bit of compression, not so much to change the sound, but just to deal with those peaks so you can get a higher level going in. Those are the kind of techniques that I would I would do to to be able to get more level in. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So you want to maximize the the analog signal that hits the analog to digital converter, just so you have plenty for that converter to work with. Correct. Yep. Basically. So okay. it would be different um, on tape. So like if we if we if we look back or think back to some of us, I don't know who the audience is or how old Jeff is, but you used to have VU meters, which were just zero, and then you'd just see a plus three. Mm -hmm. um, and so depending on the gear that you're working with, that meant, you know, the, the worlds of the existence that existed behind that meter were very different. So if you bought a little cassette machine, plus three, that thing is probably going to distort. Right. Um, and on the big boards, like I used to work on, they, you could be literally plus 24, like the, the, the pen, you know, would be completely over and it just doesn't distort because they're built to handle so much sound. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the, 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 the minus 12 minus 20 issue basically emulates that sort of scenario. So if you have in digital, in the digital world, if you have zero, um, uh, what do they call it? Full frame, full, 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 full scale, scale uh, uh, yep. zero dBFS, right? At on a digital meter, you can't really treat that as the same as the old school VU meter, right? right? Because if you go over, you're distorted. That's that's the digital way. So they emulate that by either um, most of the time in the music business they will do minus twelve, and then and production style and they generally do minus 20. So that's kind of a direct answer of how, when you're mixing, we deal with that. Um, we're definitely using the minus 12 as our zero dB point, And then we're going above that. Um, right. Because there's, there's a whole other level of 
thought. So uh, hopefully that answers sort of like the level questions. Um, the, there was a gain staging part of that in there, wasn't there? Yeah, let's let's take a look back at that and see what that said here. So let's see. Gain staging to minus 20 works well for dialogue. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the the for, for gain staging, I think <laughs> in terms of music, you kind of need to forget that. Not not that it isn't important, but the idea in production sound is we are, you know, you have a mic goes into a, a you know, one of our production mixers, and that knob is directly directly attached to the input of the recorder, right? Mm -hmm. And there aren't many options. You can't reroute, well, the new 8 series you can, but <laughs> on this older <laughs> stuff, you're kind of tied it, you know, channel one, fader one, recorder, recording channel one, and that's yep. it. And so yep. that's really awesome. And you really need to be careful with your gain staging because that is your only line of defense. And there aren't any compressors post gain. It's just right. the, the safety on the, on the input. Mm -hmm. So, in the in the in the music world, it's completely different. Everything is about sound. <clears throat> so you have the microphone that is chosen based on the sound that you're trying to get. Um, the room that you stand in, it's chosen for the sound that you're trying to get. Whether you mm -hmm. treat it or not um, for that performance is all about the sound. Uh, not necessarily the cable, but uh, you've got a cable topic later. If you can get star quad cables, um, do that. Cables do matter. Uh, the mic pre that you put it in, the compressor, um, and all of that leads to the final output, which is usually um, nowadays. I think a, a lot. What a lot of what's done is a mic is put into a channel, right? And it's got the mic pre, the power, the high pass filter, the EQ, the compressor, and the output stage all in one box. Mm -hmm. And so each one of those stages can be driven at different levels to, to achieve a sound. And I think overall gain staging does matter at the last bit, right? So the last step, if you were going to tape or to uh, your analog to digital converter, that is really where you gain stage everything before that, you know, I may be running the, the mic pre extremely hot just because it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Right. And that may, that's going to affect the compressor differently. So the, the threshold and how I deal with that is all going to be different. So gain station is definitely, um, it's thought about and done, but it's, it's just, it's an obvious thing. It's kind of and approached differently. Yeah. It seems like, yeah. Yeah. It's like you have to get it to the, to the tape, uh, to the recording medium at mm -hmm. the proper level. Yeah. Okay. And you know, that's interesting as it relates to, we had uh, somebody uh, popped up a question here. I think it was Roland. Uh, 32 bit floating here, he said. How does the advent of 32 bit floating point resolution affect Mr. Puckett's astute comments in regards to 24 bit? And I, the thought that came to my mind when, when I saw that is uh, with the Mix Pre 2 series, this is not possible with the, F, the Zoom F6, which also does 32 bit float recording with multiple, you know, analog to digital converters. But um, what I have noticed on that Mix Pre 2 series is that you do have the opportunity to set the gain still even when you're recording 32 bit float and the, you know, how you set that gain affects the overall timbre of what you're recording. Even if you're just talking about dialogue sound, um, it, it kind of, it almost starts to saturate to some extent. It starts mm -hmm. to have this kind of different sound to it. And I think it's really what you're doing is you're changing, you're doing exactly what you're describing there on the music end. If you're talking about recording music in a studio is that you're really treating this analog stage as a as a means to shape the sound and then once you've got the sound you want then you pass it over to the converter and the recorder from there Correct. so yeah and i think a big one one comment that i don't want to forget to mention because it was a huge problem in the 90s there were engineers that understood this and those that didn't and it is you must listen through the conversion process when you're getting the sounds right so in the old days it was it was set up so that you could uh, or you would just get all the mic sounds and then you kind of look at the tape machine at the last second to make sure all the levels are fine. And then you just record it. You cannot do that with digital. You must listen through the chain conversion in and out as you're getting the sound. And if you do that, as soon as you press record, it's going to sound exactly the same when you come out, you're going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a big point. 
yes, saturation is t exactly what it, it's all about. You know what each device and and the and the chain does. Am I is my mic pre? Um, my favorite one is a Neve 1073. Sounds great, and on on the things that it sounds great on, and <laughs> it has a wide range that it sounds good at, and it 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 is hot. So you're going to be saturating whatever it is after. So you have to have some really good gear to to make that happen. But yes, saturation is key, and I love those thoughts. Cool. All right. Let's. Should we go on to the second part of Jeff's question there? Uh, did we do that already? I thought. Well, let's. Oh, maybe we did. Let's go. Let's go. go I think ahead I answered that really quick first. That was basically about levels. Oh, this part. I don't think. Yeah, this is a part yeah, about yeah. dynamics processing. So compression to any of the ISOs and only apply that to the master channel. So, he, you know, yeah, he's asking. And you actually did kind of address this a little bit, but let me let me just kind of be, finish out his. Yeah, I could be really quick, more specific. Okay. ISOs going in, you wanna you wanna do what's needed. By that I mean if if you know if you're dealing with very transient material and you need a little compression going in, and it's not a it's not really about affecting the sound, it's about just keeping things, you know, if if the dynamic window was here, you just want to reduce it a little bit because no matter what, no matter what anybody says, tape and you know, recorded mediums, the headphones speakers they don't have as much dynamic range as our ears do they just it's not even close so you're it's all about taking the real world and putting it into the fake world and having it sound real so treat isos the way that you need to to make it sound great on tape um, i've got some suggestions for engineers to listen to later um, as we get into this and one of them his faders are all at zero and he records that way and then when he mixes it's it's almost the same. It's it's incredible, like what he does. So the point of that is, he gets the sound on the way to the ISOs, and the ISOs basically you just bring up the faders, and that's the mix. So there's a bunch of ways to approach that. <laughs> okay. But, so compressing could be used. I would be uh, in your younger years or uh, in your younger you know learning process. I would be mm -hmm. a little bit hesitant to kill <laughs> uh in other words do it don't do a bunch do a little bit make the isos good and then you can do it later you can treat the isos later and the mix right right good so, okay that's your point sorry to interrupt you there no no not at all not at all okay let's see if we got everything there there was another if we go back there sometimes i'm also doing video i'm using sound devices 442 direct out to f8 uh, sometimes just using the F8N as a basically a, an audio interface for audition. Had the most success using only EQ on the ISO tracks, keeping the mix pretty low in overall volume for the mix of all the instruments, and then applying compression on the master channel in audition. That seems to give me the best result, but I have no training in this and wonder if that's your general workflow. Um, I don't have... There's no one process, but I can tell you that the struggle <laughs> that you're having is uh, it's one that you never sort of you, you never give up. You're always you're always finding that process and and how is this going to make things sound? But you get a lot more comfortable when you realize that today a large part of what top mixes you know how how they're done they sit in pro tools there's pre mixing done inside of pro tools and then they output to the an analog an analog board so that process going from in the box out of the converters to the board that completely affects the sound right and it's it's a i would say if i was going to do it nowadays that's how i would do it um I would come out to an analog board, mix, and then that goes to a separate recorder. And so that process, if you have the money or if you're you know, in a big recording studio, that process is gonna be done on probably a 64 or larger, like SSL or D or some, some big board. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can afford that. 
<laughs> and so um, what people can afford are summing mixers. Um, and that's hugely popular right now. I mean, if you, I don't know if you guys know about the resource uh, Vintage Keying, it's a website. Mm -hmm. But if you look up um, summing mixers on, on that site, you're going to find quite a few. And it's the, it's the process of, you know, being able to take, for instance, if you have 12 channels of drums, you can output kick, snare, and a mix of the rest to a summing mixer. Um, guitars, background vocals, you know, you can subgroup basically your, your, all of your channels out. And what that does is it gives the effect, uh, depending on your summing mixer, but it gives you the chance to go out of the converters of your DAW into another process, analog process before you can convert the final um, con convert the final mix. And that, if you're using a decent summing mixer, that can really be beneficial. A lot of people do that now. Um, they kind of have more of a mat, like the desks at home that they work on. Um, home studios used to have mixing consoles, right? And now basically it's a mastering uh, console. So it's like, basically it's a desk with a couple of racks in it and the equipment generally that you see in home studios now are, you know, more geared to a mastering studio than a recording studio. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Because they have, they have mastering boards that are like, they're so expensive and, and they really sound good. <laughs> so you can course. you can actually tell you know that in a good pair of speakers and you can really tell what's going on yeah yeah okay good all right well thanks jeff for sharing that and, and jeff if if it's okay um if we could just put a link to your channel just so people could hear kind of contextually what we were talking about there um we'd love to do that if if not yeah, that's okay great too. recordings great recordings yeah good stuff so okay let's jump over to the next one here uh, this one's pretty kind of high level. So how would you record from a keyboard um, or sound module to a PC, mono, and stereo? I feel like there's a, there's a little bit of information there we don't have, but, but <laughs> just, uh, just yeah. generally from keyboards. Well, I, could... I know you have experience. You've got plenty of experience with keyboards. Sure, yeah. I would just say generically that um, stereo, if at all possible, um, that's going to be your best general setup. And then a lot of a lot of keyboards, modern keyboards today, have one channel or the other. Generally, it's left. Most of the time, it's labeled. But if you're going to run it mono, there's a choice. Um, they have a, you know, they may have, um, there may be, it may be important to know which one electrically um, to choose. But you can just pick that. And there's, there's no real reason not to record mono um, unless there is. So... Uh, <laughs> The other, the other trick that we used to do, because mono synths back in the day were all there were. Mm -hmm. um, so to get a stereo effect, you know, you would record one channel and you go to the next channel and then just change something subtly and record the other side. And then all of a sudden you had a stereo pad or string. So good idea, water. Yeah. Keep yourself hydrated there. Okay. <laughs> Joe, thanks for the question there. Let's go ahead and see what we have up next here. Up from Lou, I'd be interested in what you think would be the best setup for a stereo middle mic setup with each channel on a separate track for a documentary. I think, and, and maybe maybe you're reading something different here on this, Lloyd, but my sense was that this, we're, we're talking here about mid-side recording. Yeah, um, I, I think for sure. And yeah. the, the, my answer would be, you know, absolutely keep it... Um, what do they call it? Uh, I can't think of the can't think of the word at the moment. But uh, the processing, I, I would leave it to to I would leave it so that you could make the choice later. All right. So yeah. oh, the matrix matrix. I forget what they call it when they actually the, the mid side the mid side decoding. Decoding. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I would leave it encoded, right? I think so that you can. You could change the the pro, um, the mix and the width later. Uh, yeah. If you can do that, that's the way I would do it. But I've got I've got a what is this a forty twenty nine BP at Audio Technica, and it's got three settings. So one is MS, so it leaves it alone. There's no encoding. Um, 
or actually it's just encoded. And then there's a left, right wide and a left, right narrow. So it actually decodes it. So it's just stereo and that's all you get. Um, okay. You know, it's only two tracks. So you just have to make the decision about what you need. And if you have the equipment to, to deal with it later in the mix and that, that, that'll be your choice. Yeah. Well, and that's really one of the, that's one of the beauties of mid side recording, isn't it? Is that you can, you can make some of those, the width choices in post with, Absolutely. Uh, with that, that side. So yeah. cool. All right, Lou, thanks for that question. I'm going to take and see what we have up next here. Ralph, can you talk about miking grand pianos? I've had to mic them in mono and stereo for TV. They always want the lid closed for visual reasons, and I think it sounds terrible. <laughs> That's because it does. <laughs> it does sound terrible. Um, so, I mean, you have to deal with the, the, you know, the requirements put upon you. Um, if they need the lid down, I would, there's a mode for the prop. Um, I think it's called a prop the lid prop, mm -hmm. um, the arm, when it's in its down position towards the, the, the high side of the piano, there's generally like a little three or six inch. Sometimes there's two, but generally there's just one. So basically you can just prop the lid up like three just or a, six inches. Yeah. yeah. I would at least try to get them to allow that. Um, if not, you know, you just have to deal with what you, what you got. I mean, you, Generally on piano, you're dealing with two balance issues. You're dealing with attack versus body and, and body versus room. Um, sometimes, depending on the piece and the player and what's going on, you might be trying to balance high to low, but that's more of a rarity. But, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> there's not a lot you can do. If they, if they require that you have the lid down, then... Uh, it's usually darker and very uh, closed sounding. So I'd, I'd probably have a brighter set of mics. I would have them probably smaller. Um, and then it's just a matter of playing with where they are, you know, uh, uh, the distance from the player and therefore the, uh, the hammers. Okay. And, and you have to deal with the rest of it because it's, yeah. you know, if they... If you know it sounds like crap, you're just doing the best you can to make it sound as best you can. If somebody complains about it, you say, these are the restrictions that were put on me. Go talk to them. <laughs> Go talk to the producer or the director. Yeah. So the interesting thing is, um, and just to clarify, so basically you're saying, you know, get your headphones on, start moving that mic around or those mics around and, and use your ears to determine what's going to work best in terms of positioning. Absolutely. And it's a very, I mean, I, we have some more piano comments coming or uh, questions coming um, mm -hmm. and this but the general and it kind of all works for all of this the general idea is piano inherently is not a stereo instrument right it's an acoustic instrument that yes you've got two hands and they can be in two different spots and and how physically why the piano is can make it you know there's distance there and you can sort of hear that certainly mm -hmm. No argument there. But if you were to take two mics and put it on the piano and then hard pan them, it's going to sound a little odd, right? Because it's that spread is not what happens in real life. So if you're tight, you know, if you're closed lid tight miking, I, I would keep the spread to a minimum, maybe just a touch so that it, it, it opens it up a little bit. Um, and we're talking, you know, 10 and two ish. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be fine. But hard panning that, that would... I would make a bad piano sound even worse in my opinion. So <laughs> yeah. Be careful with that. Good, good. Okay. All right. All right, next up. Um, so this this one's going to take two slides. Uh, let me read it through here. I'm, ex I'm strictly an amateur. Next week, I will be recording video and audio of three musicians playing flute, clarinet, and grand piano for a YouTube video. They will play five classical music pieces in various player combinations. One, a piano solo. Two, a piano and flute duet three, a piano and clarinet duet, four, a flute and clarinet duet, and five, a trio with all three. They'll, they will probably be playing socially distanced on a stage in a fairly large church with a high ceiling. There's also a small possibility that they will play in the pianist's living room, which has hardwood floors and a vaulted ceiling. I have a mix pre three recorder and three small condenser cardioid microphones of stere stereo pair of Shure KSM-137 SL mics and a single Soyuz 
013 FET mic. The video will be shot with a Nikon Z6, and if I'm feeling ambitious, might also put another tripod mounted camera in there. Okay. And then for the piano solo and the piano duets, I plan to use the stereo pair on the piano and use the, and I'm not even sure I'm saying this right, the Soyu, Soyuz oh, on the right. other. Russian, okay. yeah, I, I know this. Well, I, I've heard of this company. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The pianist does not want mics placed over the strings, so I'm going to have to place the stereo pair outside the piano. For the flute clarinet duet and for the trio, I plan to place one mic on each instrument. One worry I have with the trio is the single mic on the grand piano. My research indicates that the best position for a single mic might be at the tail of the piano. I'd love to hear how Lloyd would set up a microphones and gain stage the audio recordings, given the equipment limitations. Also, what microphone setups and audio recording procedures would you employ for a professional recording without the equipment limitations? So I guess they're saying, given my constraints, what would you do? And then if you didn't have any constraints, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think what I hear in all of this and how I would approach it, especially consider considering where you're going to be at, um, if you have a good room, I would generally try um, I would try to mic it as a group. So I wouldn't consider any of this a limitation, what you're, what you're giving me. Um, so the easiest thing I think is two methods, I think ORTF and XY. And just depending on how this is gonna be delivered would be my choice as to which one I recorded with. You know, if, it, if it's gonna have to go mono, XY is a better choice. If it doesn't, and things are going to be uh, pretty stable if it's just going out to the web or something, then I would do ORTF. And that would be the, the stereo pair that I set up at probably, I mean, and you could play with this, kind of, kind of depends on the room and a lot of other factors. But generically speaking, 8 to 10 feet, I would set that up. And then um, your Soyuz, which is, I think... That's closer to like a KM-184, I think, is the, it's like a cigar type uh, uh, mic. I would just kind of, you know, on the duets, it's easy. You put it you know, on the, the one player besides the piano. So piano basically is covered by the stereo pair. That needs to be the main focus. And then you blend in the other instruments to, to get the balance right. Let's make that clear. Um, and the social distancing thing, I think, works out in your advantage. The problem with all of this is that you're trying to videotape it. So you have two conflicting like ideologies. Like me as a sound guy is going to want something different than Curtis as the video videographer, right? <laughs> is he going to want to set it up pretty and all that? I'm like, that isn't going to sound good. <laughs> so yeah. you've got, you've got to kind of work within that scheme. But realistically, I think having the piano and the soloist a little bit closer to the pair of mics and then spot miking that, that soloist or duet, right? So that if later you need to bring them up, you can. Um, that That's how I'd approach that. No limitations. I would use, uh, <clears throat> boy, I would love to have no limitations on that, but I, I, I'm very, <laughs> very fond of the, um, what they call the, the Deca tree. And that is a stereo miking system they developed, I think in the forties or fifties. Uh, I'm forgetting the history of it, but it's, it's a, it's a, I'm a bit of a rebel from an audio standpoint and the Deca tree setup is sort of a rebel setup, you know, like scientifically, a lot of people hate it because it doesn't make sense. And they, they argue phase and all this, but you listen to the recording and it's like, wow, <laughs> that sounds good. And at the end of the day, that's all it really matters to me. And so no, no holds. Uh, they have Neumann, M150s nowadays, which are expensive mics. They're Omni copies of the old M50s, which they used in the Decker tree setup. But <laughs> the M50s cost $10,000 used. The new ones cost $6,000. But that that setup can be emulated with an expensive, like there's a company called, have you ever, Curtis, heard of Line Audio? I think so. Yeah, think they, so. yeah. there's a, they're, cardioid condenser mic is kind of popular in production sound with a few people and but they have an omni version as well and i think i think 600 all told for the three mics that you would need i think that would be 
that would that would be my realistic uh, choice. Okay, and it, what what's the idea with the decatry? Is it like an ORTF with a with a center as well, or what what is it? No, it's a space pair, okay. and it's so wide that there's kind of a hole in the middle, and so they put a third in the in in the, uh, in the middle, and so it's okay. kind of a triangle, and they set it. There's an exact measurement. I think it's 10 feet, six inches ish. I forget. Definitely 10, 10 feet something. And they put it right over the conductor because that's that, you know, conductor is making it sound great. It's always right. sounded, you know, sounds good in that position. And the height, I think, is um, helps get the back row and a little bit of the, uh, the room. Okay. Um, and there's certainly, there's usually a, another pair of mics out on the side and possibly another pair in the, in the audience. So it's, it can be more than the three, but that main sound is coming from the, the three, and it's just, it's incredible. I, interesting. It's interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's something to work with. <laughs> um, okay. Next up from Terry. Um, and I think this is a reference to the tiny desk. We talked about this a little before, but I, uh, Terry says, I saw a video where NPR recorded, and I, and I apologize for the Yuja Wang. Uh, playing piano. NPR apparently used a single hypercardioid. It sounds really good. I have an opportunity to record a local pianist. I plan on emulating the NPR technique using a Sennheiser MKH416. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have a few about this one. I did, I, there was a link in this video as well, or excuse me, this email as well. And I checked it out really quick. And I think, uh, well, at least for the part that I watched, I didn't watch the entire thing. I just kind of got an idea of what was going on. It looks like a video that was done in the Steinway factory. And this artist, who is an incredible player, um, apparently is there probably choosing a piano for a concert that she's going to do later, which is generally what they do is someone, unless it's like Carnegie Hall, where I think they own like 10 or 20 Steinways and people pick them <laughs> and that's the one they use for tonight. Anyway, yep. um, I think... <laughs> What happened was the video person just put up their mic and that's how it was recorded. And there's a couple of reasons that I think it sounds good. One is one mic can sound good. Two mm -hmm. is that four, I think it's the 416, which has really good bottom end response. Mm -hmm. And so the distance that helps with the distance, right? So it sounds really full. The other thing is that it's a Steinway piano that sounds really good in the Steinway factory with an excellent player. So that is going to be kind of a call it in gig. Yeah, you can stick almost anything in front of that person and that piano, and it's going to sound pretty good. What makes it work, though, to be honest, is the distance back. So you can get a, an idea of the, the whole sound. So I would, I would experiment with maybe even going further back and including more room. I, on that day, certainly, if you're going to record and emulate this recording, certainly bring your 416 and put it there. But I would bring another mic and probably put it in Omni and, you know, don't limit yourself to that mic only to get that sound. Mm -hmm. Put up a couple of mics and go back home and listen. Yeah, that might be something that a guy like me would do is show up with my 416 and nothing else. And <laughs> that's, a, that's a good and as you say, mic. Yeah, you'd be OK. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So can we talk about that just a little bit? So we've talked a little bit about Omni mics on a few different occasions here today. Omnidirectional polar patterns. Why do we keep coming back to those when we're talking about recording music? What are their characteristics? Um, I think a lot of people, it's just, it's probably my tick. And it's a tick as of late because um, it takes out the, you know, the proximity effect. Um, it gets an, a more overall room sound. It, I think if you're, you know, if we look at the piano theme today, the best thing that we can do is put a piano in a room that sounds good. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's going to make it stereo, you know, you, you, you wonder why one mic sounds good. It's because, like I said before, generally piano is a mono, everything's a mono instrument. What makes it stereo is the effect, or excuse me, the, um, the delay and reverb in a room and and the sound of that room is generally what's going to make it stereo and so when we set up to get a stereo recording of a piano like this last question was you know the the artist doesn't want uh microphones over the strings duh that's that's going to be a classical artist most likely in college or, or someone who's studied because it sounds horrible it does it doesn't sound like the instrument you need to back away from the instrument and when you include the room, 
um, it's just easier to get a full picture of the room with an Omni microphone. And so that combined with the proximity effect reduction tends to be my choice nowadays. And then you can kind of tailor it back to maybe figure of eight so that you get a smaller uh, picture and say, ah, I don't like that either. Then go to cardioid. I, I just, as default, putting up a, car, a cardioid pattern anymore is not my default. I'll start big and then go in as, as I need to. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to assume that the room is going to be, uh, it's going to have a positive influence in the overall okay. sound. And yeah. if not, then you address that issue. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Was that our last one? That's our last question. Uh, that's our last pre-submitted question. Awesome. So um, I had one that was actually that I need to submit on behalf of Danny, my wife. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, she, she wanted me to get your expertise because when I record her violin, she's not happy with the results. Okay. So... <laughs> Um, she 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 wanted to know what we were, would, would be your general approach uh, recording violin and, and let me tell you some of the kind of the challenges we've had. She has a she has an instrument. It's a German. It's based on a German design, and it's a very it's 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 a very forward instrument. I mean, it's, it's it projects like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely hear what you're saying about capturing the room. Sometimes when I do that, but I'm typically using a usually a cardioid, and that may be part of my problem, I'm not sure, but um, it starts to sound pretty thin pretty quickly if I move too far away. If I get too close, of course, then we get the issue of, you know, we're starting to hear the horse hair on the strings, which is not necessarily a great sound. Mm -hmm. We've experimented with placing a microphone behind the instrument and one farther away in the room as well. That that seems to, you know, that gives me some options typically, but I think one of the things I need to go back and do is, is work with an Omni mic and just see but we can get there because she's typically recording in a, in a household space, like a living room with, with hardwood floors, high ceilings. So high, anyway. High ceilings definitely help. I would much prefer that. Um, violin, yeah, it's definitely going to be, that's going to re react definitely to a much liver room. Um, mm -hmm. So as live as you can make it, I know being at home is, is tough. Um, but that that's going to be the compromise. You're going to you're going to end up with a sound that's a little closer sonically than a typical soloist might sound. Mm -hmm. um, but that you know that isn't a horrible thing. If you if you're not super close, um, you start an omni away. I, and I think it's really hard. You know, I, I understand your comment about well, we back off and it gets kind of thin. Mm -hmm. If you start close, it's always going to sound like that. It's always going to sound like that. So. You, you need to actually start away right? mm. and then listen to it for a while um, and let that sound get sort of naturalized in your ears. And then as you get closer, it's going to be more and more present and it'll have kind of the opposite effect. It'll sound right further away. And then as you get closer and get the more, the more detail that you want or, or require, then I think it'll, it'll help. So my approach would be just, yes, Try it, if you can get an omni mic in there, especially in a, a smaller space, because you, you need as much room sound as you good room sound as you possibly can get, because mm -hmm. um, you're not in a church or a, a stage environment. So right. that's, I think that's you guys' biggest limiting factor. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Well, if if you're okay on time, Lloyd, um, we'd love right. to go to the the chat here and see if we have some questions here that uh, we can bring in. Go ahead, Emma, if we've got something there. Here's one for Lloyd. What are some of the bigger mistakes you hear audio engineers make? <laughs> you know, it's it's less, I think there's a lot of technology that takes away some of the worst things that could happen, um, at, at least compared to the past. To me, I think the biggest problem is just how the music industry as a whole requires music to be delivered. Um, that's the biggest thing. The, the other, the other, you know, if we, if we, you know, take pop music and mixing for that, that idiom out of it. Um, and I look at young engineers that are coming up. It's, uh, the, the thought, uh, you know, the look in their eye and I can, I can almost spot it within five minutes of talking to somebody that they've got it all figured out, I think is the biggest mistake. Um, mm -hmm. The sooner you can get mature 
I remember specifically the day I went, oh, I just had, you know, my lunch handed to me and <laughs> I deserved it and I get it now. Like I, I remember explicitly the day that it happened. And I, I hope <laughs> that that as we, you know, as we progress as a, you know, the human species, that that can happen <laughs> a lot earlier in a, a person's life. And I think, you know, the, the things that you learn after you know it all are the most valuable. Excellent. Yes. And I'm curious, I'm curious too, um, when you say about the way the music is delivered, if we're talking about popular music, are you talking about, I mean, we have the loudness issue. Um, that's a big, is that a part of what you were referencing? It is. And we could get into like heavier discussions about content and what is actually being said in, in, in music and why it even exists um, to be, to, <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. It, you know, I would love for, um, you know, there, there's there's a smaller and smaller space for true actual music. And I'm not jumping on I hate pop because I really love it and I think it's it's, it's great. But um, there's a tendency to like music now that is less and less music. And, I, I you know, okay. the requirements for, for doing music are pretty harsh, you know, the level wars and all of that. And then, you know, if you take the music away and start, but whatever. I'm, I'm uh, okay. Just fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we have a couple more here. Let's see from Bob. I've read that classical music should generally not be compressed and given a good room. Reverb should be added very lightly. Agree. Generally speaking, um, I, I agree. No reverb. Um, that should all be recorded in house. Um, so you're going to, if it's an orchestra, they're going to be in a space that's probably pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Even the bad orchestral rooms are pretty darn good. Um, so mm -hmm. in that instance, I would, if it's a known kind of tough room, I would just put more stereo miking in the audience, you know, in many positions as I could, and then obviously capture the the orchestra as best as possible. And then that way you have more experimentation, uh, you know, in terms of filling in that reverb sound. Compression, I don't agree with that. Um, everything. There are a lot of hidden things about <laughs> the music business that, have, that they're hidden in plain sight. So there are people who love LP records. They love, mm -hmm. they love records. Records have so much compression put on them by the mastering engineer before they cut the record before they cut the record. And it's a kind of compression that you don't necessarily hear. I mean, you hear it if you can A, B things, but mm -hmm. it's such a delicate, you know, fancy um, compressor that they use. Uh, it, it's generally not heard. And it's so baked into what we, you know, that we listen to all the time, at least the older stuff on, on records specifically. Um, there's an EQ curve as well because they, they can't print full bandwidth on a, on a record. You, it just, they can't cut it. So they change the EQ going in and then on the way back out, there has to be a, an RIAA. I'm forgetting my record tech, but there's a, there's an EQ curve that has to be on the device listening mm -hmm. and then it brings it back to normal. So it's really hard to hear people say, Oh, I love records and they sounded so great. They do but they're not like the original because I've heard the original and LPs and it's not the same thing. And so compression is needed to, again, an acoustic orchestral window, you know, there could be zero to 115 dB, 120 dB at times, certainly not all the time, but their window is dynamic and it's larger than recording medium. So there needs to be a little bit of compression to kind of bring that into Makes sense. Yep. Spec. Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, is the explosion of decent prosumer grade hardware and software impacting professional sound engineering the way that DSLRs have impacted professional photography? Yes. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try and get a job in the music industry in an, in a there recording is no engineer. Music industry. Yeah. There is no <laughs> music industry anymore. So yeah, th yeah, there's so many people ask me like, what do I do to become a recording engineer? I'm like, become a film engineer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, don't or a game sound designer 
don't yeah. even waste your time in, in music. It's yeah. it's very. It was difficult in the '90s um, when I was coming up, and that was when the transition from you know analog to digital was happening, and it was mm. it was an, a, a difficult process then. And uh, I think at that point, at least thirty percent of the studios had closed that you know were originally there, and then now, I mean, there's only a handful of anything left. So, yeah. Okay. All right. See here, do we have any others that are coming in? If you do have a question, we have just a couple more minutes here. Um, just go ahead and put, if you could, put at Curtis Judd audio, and that way we'll it'll kind of mark it for us, and we'll be able to pull that up. Yeah. So there's there is one thing I would add while we're waiting for questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a there's a miking system by Earthworks. Isn't that an Earthworks mic that you have? It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've got a um, a bar that goes across the body of the instrument and has two mics on a gooseneck. Um, it's kind of an expensive system, but, um, you know, if you're in an environment where you have to have the top closed all the time, um, that is, that is a pretty good, you know, earthworks are generally really good sounding, uh, microphones. Um, they're not used a lot, I think in music, uh, like pop music production right. because they're so, they're so flat. Um, things that are that have absolutely zero character, which is a good thing, right? Uh, depending on what you need, like right. that that would be great for orchestral recording or you know putting in front of a guitar, or, you know, some some individual things. But if it doesn't have character, it kind of doesn't get sold on the pop market all that that easily. But <laughs> Earthworks, great stuff, and they have a they have a piano miking system that's pretty cool. Okay, that's a good one to know. Good one to know. Um, I have seen them a little bit on, um, as drum overheads, the, you know, the kind of the funny looking, the earthworks that have that kind of unusual shape. Mm -hmm. so, uh, for those that are not familiar, they're often used as kind of measurement microphones again, because of their very flat frequency response. But I've also seen them used as drum overheads. Interestingly, um, of That's... course they'll, they'll pop on all of the very colored microphones as spot mics on, mm -hmm. around the kit, but they'll use yep, the earthworks. Absolutely. Well. And yeah. I think that pair was, uh, that was based on the first mic that was introduced by Earthworks uh, yeah. for audio um, recording. I remember that very well. And I was using, get this, I was, my favorite was B&K 4011s, but B&K okay. is now DPA. Oh, okay. So okay. 4011 was just a, uh, uh, oh, what is it? A cardioid you know, a little, a small, small, uh, small diaphragm cardioid mic, okay. which I think they still make. It, yeah. Yep. Just under DPA heading. Yep. Okay. Here's a question that came in. What do you think of instrument clip mics compared with regular mics? Uh, you got to do what you got to do. Um, <laughs> I, I think. Cause you use, you use some of those, right? You, in the, certainly in the, um, pageantry arts sure have yeah, clip yeah. Mics. yeah absolutely um and not all clip mics are the same um i would lead you directly <laughs> to the dpa 4099 um as i think the most versatile um super cardioid clip on microphone because they have they have mounts for just about anything i'm not sponsored by dpa boy i wish i was <laughs> um but jiminy christmas they they sound really really good um, and most situations. So if you have that, it's a pretty good mic. Um, are there better options? Totally. Um, if I'm in a, re in a scenario where I'm just recording for um, the heck of it, and it's not a performance with anybody watching, or, you know, and I'm not going out of a, a sound system, then yeah, I'm going to, I'm probably not going to use that clip on mic unless it's the best choice of the options that you have. Okay. And how do you, how do you come to a and a, a decision about what's going to be the best. Just listening. Uh, okay. You know, you put up what we call a press conference, you know, so if we were going to, you know, we generally don't get into too much of that until it becomes the singer and pop music recording that is. Mm -hmm. um, and then when a singer steps up, you know, you've got six, three mics facing down and three mics facing up um, and you have them sing and you're just listening to mics and then you pick a mic 
and then you put that mic through different mic pre's and then you pick a mic pre <laughs> you know and the process goes <laughs> on until you finally find the system that sounds good for that person mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. project um if you don't have those kind of options um you know and if it's just two mics and it's really really easy you just record one for a bit set up the next one record it for a bit and then just honestly a b walk away do what you have to do to not make a biased choice um, mm -hmm. and just listen and go oh that one sounds right yeah yeah and i think that's interesting that that that, that i think is part of what comes along in terms of um, maturity as an engineer it seems like as you you learn these kind of basic things you learn okay Sometimes I need to step away for a little bit well and kind of reset my ears, come back 15 minutes later, close my eyes and play both of them, you know, or, or have someone play them for you so you don't know which is which. So you're not coming in with biases or, you know, whatever it may be. But definitely, I've, I, I know that when I was starting out, there was no way I could, you know, like, I would just, I felt so overwhelmed by everything mm -hmm. that I didn't know how to make those decisions. I didn't know, you know, and I, you'd hear people say, okay, yeah, you need to have reference tracks, listen to reference tracks. And I'd be like, well, it's not helping. My recordings aren't getting any better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can give you one little tip about that. Um, my mentor did a, had an awesome trick. Um, and this is kind of the next, you know, this is like 102 version of, you know, listen to reference mixes. Mm -hmm. But if you take and put, well, we used to listen on a board. And so you have a playback button. So, you know, if no buttons are pressed, you're hearing the mix, or you could hear, you know, tape playback, right? And so we listen to a CD, but we take one side of the recording, or uh, one of the cables, and knock it out of phase. And so when you listen to it, all you would hear is the stereo information that didn't cancel mono, right? So when you do that, you can hear a lot of the effects that are put on. Mm -hmm. And so you had a really good idea of whether it was a room sound or an effect or a delay. And it was just another level of listening that, um, you know, for instance, Bob Clear Mountain is one of the, you know, the most awesome mix engineers that you're going to listen to. And you take some of his stuff and you flip it up, you know, one side out of phase and you listen to his effects and you're like, hmm, that's interesting. You, you learn more than you think you would from that stuff. Interesting. There's a little something for people to chew on there. Yep. Good. All right. Um, let's see. That's about it. Okay. And we are at the top of the hour. Lloyd, is there anything else you wanted to, to cover before we wrap up here? Nope. Nope. I, th I may send you a link to put in the show notes. There's a, there's a, to, to emulate sort of a wall of, you know, a press conference. There was a, a, a video of a couple doing, microphones like they both saying down this wall of microphones and listening you know a lot of people get caught up in what mic to use i know that i know it's a co common topic of discussion here mm -hmm. you'd be surprised at the subtlety between mics like even vastly different mics there it can be relatively subtle i mean i as a professional and certainly other professionals would just go oh my god that's night and day but you really listen to it and you go, that's, that's really pretty subtle. You know, right. you should worry, I guess the point of it being kind of worry less about the microphone and more about the performance and the space and, and those sort of things and what you're hearing. But I'll, I'll try to get a link to send to you to put in the show notes so that people can listen to that. That'd be great. I would appreciate that. And then you also mentioned, was it Bob Clear? Oh yeah, Bob? there's, we can put that in the show notes too. Bob Clear Mountain, Al Schmidt. Clear Mountain. Oh my God. If you want to emulate anyone, Al Schmidt is the one. Uh, popular music wise, uh, Chris Lord Algae. Mm -hmm. Those are three people to, you could learn a lot from. And there's probably a lot of information on the internet about them as well. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, Lloyd, thanks so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody, Soundies out there. Get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.